Today on Earth Focus, water may be the new oil. The demand for it is growing as there's less to go around. With population growth, expanding economies, increasing pollution and climate change, the demand for water will be greater than ever. Will we meet the challenge? We'll hear from the people who are making a difference, filmmakers, water experts, and advocates. And we'll see what steps can be taken to meet this pressing need. All coming up on Earth Focus. El agua es vida. Más zindi moy. Jolly jibon. What is life? Riyak asling. In any language, the link between water and human existence is clear. Next to air, nothing is more essential for life. Over a billion people can't count on their next glass of water being safe to drink. Two and a half billion lack basic sanitation. The number of people whose health is compromised from water-related disease is staggering. And the tragedy is that these numbers represent children who are living too sick and dying too soon. Water availability is not just a problem in developing countries. The United States is also becoming increasingly vulnerable. Filmmaker Jim Tebow is hoping to get the word out and to galvanize action. Tebow is the president of the Chronicles Group, a Los Angeles-based nonprofit public information and education film production company. In 2005, he made the critically acclaimed film Running Dry about the global water crisis. Let's take a look. There is no greater issue confronting the world than the water scarcity and quality crisis. Every day, 14,000 people die because of a lack of water or from disease caused by water pollution. And 9,500 of these are children. We are living on 1% of the world's water, and most of that is used for agriculture. The other 99% of the world's water is too salty to drink, or composed of icebergs and snow. Water is a very precious resource, and a quarter of the world's population urgently needs clean water. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson speaks with Jim Tebow about his work in film and solutions to the world's water crisis. Jim Tebow, you're making films now about water. What got you interested in water? Paul Simon, Senator Paul Simon, wrote the book Tapped Out. And, um, and I felt that it was important to convey that message. That message was what? To put together a massive public information education program to educate the planet regarding the severity of this evolving crisis. Every 15 seconds, a child dies from a lack of water or water-related diseases in developing countries. What is life like for the people who are running short of water or get very little of it for sanitation or for drinking? It's beyond comprehension. It is a living nightmare. I can't imagine any American beginning to even comprehend, even the Americans who even live in sad circumstances even in our own country. Nothing can compare to what it's like to be living in a slum area where you have no sanitation whatsoever, where toilets drain right into an open sewer that right, runs right down the, uh, in the middle of a, a community. Children getting cholera is, is commonplace among these children. It is absolutely inhuman. This is not just a problem for third world nations. We're starting to feel it here in this country, particularly in the Southwest. You've made a film about that. Let's take a look. Because of climate change, because of extreme weather, there are growing crises uh, in water in the southwestern part of the United States. When there's a real question as to whether or not Lake Mead uh, will in fact be viable in another 20 years. Whether or not the Hoover Dam will be able to generate electricity. The bottom line is there's only so much water in the Colorado River. 
And I think right now the Colorado River provides water for something like 30 million people. It's, it's really not that big of a river compared to other rivers. My concern is that we're going to have Native communities who are really going to be looking at a time when they're going to have their water resources drying, dried up. Well, every morning, you know, every morning at dawn we pray. Then the second thought is, do we have enough water? Should we haul water today? And it, how long will this water last? There is no physical infrastructure to get water to many of the dwellings of uh, people, for example, on the Navajo Reservation, uh, same thing with electricity. So there are circumstances uh, in our own country which are uh, in other, in other uh, parts of the world would, we would think of as third world conditions. Sometimes the water that we believe is safe, then we find out that it's not safe and it causes health issues. And clearly our water management system is focused on those who want to extract and use the water supply, not specifically designed to protect rivers, ecosystems, and habitats. And they're really taking the brunt of a lot of our decisions. The only time I think people understand the importance of water is when all of a sudden they don't have it. And the fact that without water there is uh, no quality of life. The, the problem began really on the Colorado in, in the 20s when they allocated the Colorado River at a time when it was, it was an abundant flow. And they never projected the fact that the kind of growth that would occur in the American Southwest, the new population is, is projected to be located in Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, even Utah. These regions are all growing by leaps and bounds. And everyone just feels, well, you know, we've always been able to find water. Well, that, those days are over. The people who are feeling this most acutely are the Native Americans. How could that be going on in a country that's the richest country in the world? There are villages on the Hopi Nation that are going to dry up. They will not have any water at all. There are over 85,000 members of the Navajo Nation who have to drive many, many miles just to get water every day to take it back to their home. The average American uses anywhere from 100 to 200 gallons per day. People on the Navajo Reservation maybe use 25 or 30 gallons a day. In dealing with this crisis, are Americans going to have to make some sacrifices? What are they going to have to give up? Well, I propose the fact that we need a total paradigm shift on how we live our lives in general. One is public policy. Uh, the federal government needs to work with state, local governments in terms of creating the kind of public policy that's really required, including an, a national water policy and land use planning and those kinds of elements. We also need to utilize our technology much more. Every region needs to become self-sufficient and we need to focus on reusing water instead of going out and mining for, for new water because there, there isn't going to be any more water. And third is conservation. And conservation is good economics. You've got two films about water under your belt. You've got a third one coming up. Would you talk a little bit about what that is? The next project is um, that I want to focus on water and the, and the humanitarian crises in relationship to na international security concerns. And I want to go out in the world and show the, the relationship between this crisis and global security. And I want to provide examples where we could perhaps have global harmony. Jim Tebow, thank you very much. You're welcome. Water is important to our national security, says a new report by the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. The report, Global Water Futures, was launched at an event in the U.S. Capitol on September 23, 2008. Report co-author Eric Peterson and working group advisor Jeffrey DeBelco share their insights on why the water challenge has geopolitical impact and why policymakers should take note. The case is clear that already we're drawing down on a whole range of water resources in a way that is unsustainable. Water is a tremendously complicated challenge for policymakers across the board. We don't understand precisely the dynamics of water usage across the world. There are a number of factors that are changing our use of water that are very difficult to track. 
unrelenting population growth. We have environmental degradation, looming issues like climate change. This has implications for broader economic development, poverty alleviation, a whole range of environmental stewardship issues, and human health. What we've emphasized in our report is that it even goes beyond that and includes stability and security in a number of key regions and key countries across the world. Why did Bolivia privatize the water systems of Cochabamba and El Alto? It's not like Bolivian citizens decided it was a good idea. Water privatization was absolutely forced on Bolivia by the World Bank. In 1997, the World Bank told Bolivia that if they did not privatize the water system of Cochabamba and El Alto La Paz, that they were going to be cut off from water development loans by the World Bank. Bolivia is just one example of a country that was forced to privatize water. Thousands of poor families had to spend half of their monthly income for water. The protests, first in Cochabamba and later in El Alto La Paz, are among the best-known conflicts over water privatization. They're an extreme example, but there have also been successful cases of water management that balance community, private sector, and government involvement. In each case, the most effective solutions need to be found to get water and sanitation to the people who need it. In an age of water scarcity, conflicts over water may be unavoidable, but will they escalate? Because we haven't seen states fight one another over water, it does not mean that there's not an awful lot of conflict over water. Uh, it, but it is often uh, uh, within states uh, for a variety of different reasons. And it is not in our traditional notion of, of armed groups squaring off, but it's much more around social conflict. So it's around uh, the human right to water and privatization and pricing. We see social conflict around mega dams or mega projects where the World Commission on Dams estimated in the second half of the 20th century, 40 to 80 million people were displaced by large dams. So while it is not the exchange between militaries, we could say a kind of a violent displacement of people that has real impacts. We're talking tens of millions of people. We're talking the population of a large European country. This is really a huge number of people. The problem is that promises are made all the time to the affected people to encourage people to move. We'll give you a nice new house. We'll give you clean water. We'll give you electricity. But nobody is actually accountable for these promises to be fulfilled. Promises are made. People are moved. The project is built. And then a year later, people still don't have their land. There's nothing for them to do. They have no legal recourse in most cases to hold anyone accountable. Within 20 years, almost a half of the world's population will live in water-stressed countries. Today, 260 rivers share international borders. 40% of the world's people live in more than 260 international river basins that have major economic or social significance. Interstate tensions could erupt and intensify as increasing water scarcity raises the stakes. They don't have a choice! Such instability can go against U.S. interests or even pose a threat to U.S. security. While the possibility of conflict is always present, water may be so important a commodity that it will inspire interdependence and cooperation instead of hostility. Even in places where we traditionally associate water with conflict, such as the Middle East, we see dynamic examples of people on the ground, finding ways to cooperate over water, even when the larger relationship is very conflictual. And so you have, for example, in the Middle East, an organization called Friends of the Earth Middle East, which is jointly headed by a Jordanian, Israeli, and Palestinian co-directors, starting at very local level, schools and communities that are um, next to one another, where essentially they're mutually interdependent around the lack of treatment of sanitation. Everyone's kids are getting sick if you're not treating the sanitation, whether you're on one side of the border or not. And that that's something that necessitates long-term cooperation because we're fundamentally dependent on um, those resources being vital and available and not something, there's something that gives us life and not something that makes us sick. It's a critical time for us to think now on how we re-engage the rest of the world. 
And as we look forward, the logic, I believe, is tremendously compelling that strategic resource management has to be at the core of how we think about our role with the rest of the world. Our report emphasizes three things. The first is that we need a more integrated strategy when it comes to water across all the agencies of the U.S. government that are engaged in exercising what we call U.S. international water policy. That's point one. Point two is that resources need to be expanded. Our level of investment is not commensurate. And number three is we need more political clout. We think that it's absolutely critical that we concentrate power in a single individual who would have the support of the president in moving a new, bold water agenda forward. I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that how well we manage to manage this challenge of water in the world will reflect on our capacity to deal with a whole range of broader foreign assistance and economic development issues for years to come. Nobody wants to talk about toilets, yet we're facing a sanitation crisis. Almost half of the world's people don't have access to a toilet. Simply put, open defecation kills. To draw attention to the issue, advocates gathered at the U.S. Capitol on World Toilet Day, November 19, 2008. And yes, we can. We can reach the goal. Of the goal is to cut in half the proportion of people without access to toilets by the year 2015. It's a global problem. It's a global crisis. It is the single largest environmental public health crisis on the planet today. There's this feeling that when you do your business out in a field or in the woods, that the feces that you produce are not going to cause any harm. But of course, the rain comes and washes it away. Away into the water supply or into direct contact with hands and feet. Bacterial infection from human waste kills 1.8 million people every year, most of them children. In schools overseas, in developing countries, especially in Africa and Asia, 75% of schools do not have any sanitation facilities. That means toilets or latrines and places where children can wash their hands. When schools don't have a toilet, girls drop out, particularly when they reach puberty. A simple toilet can help to ensure that a girl gets the education that not only benefits her, but her family and community as a whole. Lack of toilets also puts women at risk of physical harm when they venture into the bush for privacy and has economic consequences for every parent who misses work caring for children made sick from poor sanitation. Toilets are about health, dignity, and safety. They're also about money. Every dollar invested in sanitation brings a tenfold return in increased productivity, and good sanitation doesn't cost a lot. It will cost $10 billion a year to achieve the goal of cutting in half the number of people without basic sanitation. However, it will save $100 billion in health and education costs. 2008 was the International Year of Sanitation, but that is not enough. Toilet Day advocates want U.S. policymakers to take action now. The 2005 Paul Simon Water for the Poor Act made it a priority for U.S. foreign aid to work on water and sanitation programs. In 2008, Congress authorized $300 million for this goal. Water activists are asking that this funding be increased. We have to be able to talk about it. We have to be able to say toilet. We have to be able to say defecation. We have to be able to say feces. You cannot go on addressing sanitation if you talk all the time in, uh, in, in code. Clean toilets for everyone. Feces. Clean toilets for everyone. Meeting the world's water needs is a multifaceted challenge. Since 1991, water experts have met annually during World Water Week to find ways to meet that challenge. The most recent World Water Week was held in Stockholm, Sweden, August 17 through 23, 2008. Professor John Anthony Allen from King's College, London, was awarded the $150,000 2008 Stockholm Water Prize for creating the concept of virtual water. Virtual water is a measurement of how much water goes into the production and trade of food and consumer products. 
The a cup of coffee takes 145 litres to produce it, both in growing and processing and, and so on, and, and making it. Uh, and if people realised that they were using so much water in doing that, they would also think about it. Virtual water lets you see your morning coffee in a new way. The virtual water in that cup includes the water that went into the growing, production, packaging, and shipping of the beans. So, virtually speaking, a cup of coffee equals the amount of actual water a person in England uses daily for all their needs. Virtual water has a major impact on global trade, especially in water-scarce regions. It explains why nations, such as the U.S. and Argentina, export billions of liters of water each year, and why nations like Egypt and Japan import them. And virtual water has implications for food production in an era of water scarcity. It takes 1,300 liters of water to produce a kilogram of wheat, but 15,000 liters of water to produce a kilogram of beef. The water needed to provide a non-vegetarian diet, a meat-eating diet, is dramatically more water consumptive than a vegetarian diet. So I now challenge people, are you a two and a half meter a day person or a five meter a day person? Because if you're a five meter a day person, you're eating a, a rather large amount of meat. If you're a vegetarian, you're only using um, two and a half meters a day, which would solve the problem. Vegetarian diets may increasingly be in our future. Agriculture is already the leading consumer of water, and with a growing population, the demand for water will only increase. Concepts like virtual water can help ensure for better management of our scarce water resources. <laughs> Clean water and sanitation are basic human rights, but the poor get the short end of the stick. One of the organizations meeting this challenge is London-based WaterAid. WaterAid works with local partners in 17 countries to bring cost-effective, sustainable water and sanitation services to the poor. WaterAid experts Henry Northover and Girish Menon tell us what can really work. This is a crisis that impacts disproportionately on women. It's women who bear the brunt of water carrying. It's women who forego an education uh, because girls uh, are doing most of the water carrying. Uh, it's women in slum areas who can't go into the central business district because they're spending hours waiting for the one, maybe two hours, water comes to their standpipe in their slum. It's women who, who basically are not having their voice heard in terms of this uh, most essential of services. Water and sanitation cut across many sectors, sectors like health and education. Investing in health and education without also investing in water and sanitation may not always be productive. If you're a child taking medicines, vital medicines, but swallowing that, those medicines with, with water contaminated by human sewage, you know, you're undermining your health efforts. If you're saying to uh, children, girls, uh, boys, both should be going to school in equal numbers. There should be absolutely no gender bias in accessing education. And yet girls are still spending two hours a day walking miles just to fetch safe water and are excluded from school because they are going out fetching water. Then you're going to find those educational investments, those health investments undermined. Who is in need of these services? People who need these services tend to be the poorest and the most marginalized. They are in a single, in a very simple way, they're voiceless. They're not in a position to demand for their rights. They're not even aware that they have these rights and entitlements in their countries that they live in. They are voiceless and unorganized, so policymakers and elected representatives don't think it's important to ensure that they are provided with services like water and sanitation. Getting clean water and sanitation is one of the simplest steps in breaking the cycle of poverty, yet it's often on the bottom of the list when it comes to investment by policymakers who give priority to sectors like defense or to donors who fund development projects. From the mid-1990s, you've seen a doubling of aid, you've seen a doubling of spending on health and education. Over that same period, you've seen the share of aid going to water and sanitation contracting. The critical lack here is one of political will, that in a sense we've got a blind spot when it comes to these most essential of services. 
On the national level, building political will involves bringing policymakers, bureaucrats, and technicians together to find lasting and sustainable solutions. And it also involves empowering the people to speak out for themselves, to become engaged in the process, and to identify the solutions that best work for them. Grassroots education is very much a part of it. Uh, Water Aid itself works with communities to focus their own demands on uh, local government authorities, uh, other providers, to try and get water and sanitation services come to them. But more than technology, what we find is it's about motivating people to change their behavior, where the emphasis was less on technology and more on educating the people on the dangers of open defecation. And through a process of naming and shaming, trying to get people convinced that if you have 100 houses in the community, even if one of them defecates in the open, that's a very strong, huge health risk to the entire community. Uh, we are increasingly delighted that in some countries, for example, in Madagascar, uh, partly because of the long uh, influencing work that, that we did in the country that the president of Madagascar recently announced that they're setting up a ministry for water and sanitation, which is just brilliant news. There are many demands for water, including agriculture and industry, but a lot can happen when local people and local governments work together to ensure that local needs are met and that the people who need good quality water can have access to it in an equitable way. Water is absolutely fundamental and so is sanitation. They do go hand in hand and together if you punch in the hygiene messages that's what makes for healthy and dignified lives. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.